Radhe Radhe. Welcome to the beginning of another live Sangha. May this be an offering to Sri Radha Krishna. <laughs> and as we await our first guests to arrive, allow me to set the intention for this space as being a welcoming, all inclusive environment for you to feel comfortable, safe, accepted in. Hello, Dylan. <laughs> you are very early. And may we come together as fellow spiritual seekers to uplift each other, relate in one another's experiences, and share positive sentiments. Thank you. And thank you, Kevin, for blessing us so early on with a heart me. Radhe, Radhe. And hello to you. Hello, Marie. And hello, Eddie. I trust that those who are joining us now are feeling as well as they can, given whatever events in their life may be unfolding. And hey, even if you're not feeling 100%, that's okay, Joe. Hello, Mergle Grump. Hello, Kimmy. Yes, it's a beautiful day today. As it is every day. <laughs> Sometimes the beauty may be hidden, but it's there. Hello, Greg RG. Hello, Anna Lou. Radhe, Radhe. Early times again? No, I don't think so. This is my regular time. 5 p.m. Pacific time. <laughs> At the moment. And hello, Zayla. Oscar GSD, you ask a very interesting question. Do I have any advice to know when someone is lying to me? It's a good question. Um, usually, I try to just stick with the facts of what I know and make a judgment, rather than trying to interpret whether they are telling the truth or not. Now, if there is reason for lying, maybe investigate that reason and affirm to the person that you don't have to hide the truth. Whatever it may be, I would rather know than not know. And hello, Sagiko. Hello, Dallas. Hello, Nadi. Greg, are you sure? You should say early timing for yourself. Okay, <laughs> that makes more sense. Now, since you all are so early, I have a question of the day for all of you, if you are interested. Today's question is a little more difficult, at least in my opinion. Today I'm wondering, how can vulnerability or why can vulnerability be freeing? Sometimes we think of it as a deficit that you shouldn't be vulnerable but other times it can feel great to have someone that you feel vulnerable around that you're allowed to be vulnerable I should say so why is that how can this apparent deficit be an opening experience and hello Boladale Hello, Emily. I'm doing well today. Thank you. And Momento Pink, hello. Daninsky, you share. Opening possibilities. I like that. I see the vibe behind that, and that makes a lot of sense. And Dylan, you share that it removes expectations. Definitely. Yeah, that's a wise observation. And Eddie, you share. Pushing your comfort zone. Definitely. Yeah. Of course, if we're vulnerable, that means we're outside our comfort zone. We're expanding. We're growing in some way. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy you're here, RB. You share that today has been pretty bad. <laughs> That's okay. Let not how the day has unfolded so far affect your expectations for how this present moment may be. Even if you've had a bad day, 
that doesn't preclude you from having a good moment now. And rats you share because you get to know your boundaries and overgrow them, you would say. I love the way you put that. Yeah. And <laughs> thank you, Dob Darker, for your heart me. And G to infinity. You share way too appropriate today for this question. <laughs> oh my goodness. I wonder what has transpired today. And happy to see you, Daninsky, as well. And hello, Donsuela. You share that it can lead you to new discoveries about yourself and the world around you. Very true, isn't it? And Zela, you shared, allows us to let go of our defenses and masks and truly be ourselves. That's so true, isn't it? Well said. Sure, do you share that boundaries hold us back? Being vulnerable removes boundaries, varies, and that's when we're free. I understand. I love that. Leah, you share that vulnerability is our true self. <laughs> Very powerful observation. D. Eggers, you share that when you're vulnerable, if you accept not having control, you'll be as free as ever. And that can be a very difficult thing to come to, but a very powerful perspective to have when there isn't anything else we could do, for example. And Lars, you shared that you can let go of insecurities. I like that. The daily you share that it helps keep the right people around you. That's a very wise observation too. Sometimes we may think about it the other way around, that having the right people around you is what it takes to allow yourself to be vulnerable. But allowing yourself to be vulnerable can certainly be a great motivation to keep the right people around you. It'd be like that sometimes. <laughs> you ask a a question, how does one come out of being upset when in the moment we feel not being heard by our guides? We are always guided, whether we realize it or not. We are guided even in our feelings of being upset. You are allowed to be upset. Being upset is such a, a valuable experience as it is an authentic expression of your feelings. And hello, Gentry, honey. Maddie, you share that when we open up, we let that weight go. Very true. Nice to see you today, Heather. <laughs> Thank you, Grandma Lala. Giovanna, you ask, can I tell you something about the heart? Can I tell you something about the heart? <laughs> <laughs> there are many things one could say about the heart. It is said that the heart is where the spiritual mind resides. We have our intellectual mind up here, but the spiritual mind does its thinking in the heart, in our center. Mimi Ceramics, you share that it's scary. Being vulnerable is very scary. <laughs> G to infinity, you share that vulnerability opens our creative spark. Heather, you share that being vulnerable to someone means having trust in them. This is a warm feeling. I like that. <laughs> and Memento Pink, you share the freedom of being oneself in all its entirety. So true. And I like what you added, Emerald Sky. It's being authentic. Hmm. All right. Now 
we've explored many ways in which being vulnerable can be freeing. I thank you. As you all know, I like to start my lives with a question of the day. And I'm sure that we could keep exploring this question because there's a lot more room in probably all of our lives to allow ourselves this freedom of being vulnerable instead of being always on guard even during times where there is no threat. A lovely meditation for today. And thank you all. <laughs> now, after my question of the day, I like to read a short reading from Roar the Ganges. This is a book gifted to me by Sky Guardian, one of our viewers, from his guru, Swami Tadatmananda, who is the author of this book and through whom this book takes place. We are very close to finishing this book. We are on the final few chapters. For most of this book, it was a kind of preparation for the author's initiation into being a Hindu monk of the Sarasvati order, becoming a Swami. These chapters now guide us to what it's like being a Hindu monk, what it's like from the perspective of someone who was once a Westerner, like many of us here, including myself, but renounced that life and dedicated it solely to the pursuit of spiritual enlightenment. This chapter is called the heart of devotion. A thin silver, a thin sliver of moon hung low in the western sky, where the horizon still glowed dimly as we once again crowded around our guru, Swami Dayananda, on his porch for satsang, a spiritual gathering, after dinner. All ashram residents were there, except Swami Sudhananda, who was attending to business in the office. Swami Dayananda would be leaving the ashram tomorrow and would not return again for many months, so everyone was eager for his company. Richard, our uh, British friend, was full of questions tonight. He began by asking, this whole pantheon of gods and goddesses, Shiva, the destroyer, Vishnu, the pervader, Ganesha, the remover of obstacles, and the rest, how do they all fit into the teachings of Vedanta, the study of the Vedas, humanity's oldest scriptures? Swami Dayananda replied, They are all part of Hindu religious culture, part of its theology, Yet, Vedanta itself is not concerned with theology. It does not dictate the forms in which you should worship God, Ishvara, nor does it propagate particular beliefs about these forms. Vedanta is concerned with realities, the truth, the truth of yourself, the truth of the world, and the truth of Ishvara. Instead of telling us what to believe, it leads us to understand what is true. The many forms in which God is worshipped are all based on the Vedic vision, Ishvara. Ishvara literally means Lord. I prefer to say Ishvara because the word God has many other connotations which create confusion. The ancient rishis were great mystics who could directly perceive reality. They knew Ishvara not as a matter of belief, but as a matter of direct experience. They unfolded their vision of Ishvara in the hymns of the Vedas and the teachings of the Upanishads. One famous Vedic hymn describes Ishvara as the cosmic person, Purusha, the creator, 
The Source of the Universe Swami Dayananda chanted several lines of this hymn, Purusha Suktam, following the traditional Vedic intonation. His deep voice was warm and resonant. Om Sahasrashirasha Purushaha Sahasrakshas Sahasrapat and so on, which translates to Purusha is he of a thousand heads, of a thousand eyes, and a thousand feet. Completely does he pervade the world, and yet he extends beyond even that. Purusha indeed is this entire cosmos, all that was and all that will be. I'm happy you feel safe here. Finishing his brief recitation, Swami Dayananda explained, a thousand heads a thousand eyes, a thousand feet. Do you think the Rishis envisioned Ishvara as a strange creature with thousands of appendages? No. This is all symbolic. A thousand heads, eyes and feet represent all heads, all eyes and all feet. These all belong to Ishvara because Every head, eye, and foot that exists is a part of his body. The sages envisioned the entire physical universe as Ishvara's body. Why? Because in their vision, Ishvara is the stuff of the cosmos, the underlying reality of the universe. To appreciate the Vedic vision of Ishvara, we must understand the act of creation. In any act of creation, two basic factors are necessary, knowledge and material. Knowledge of what is to be created and the material form which it is to be made. In philosophy, these two factors are called intelligent cause and material cause. Consider the creation of a clay pot. The pot's creator, the potter, must have knowledge. He must know what is a pot and how to make it. He must also have clay. <laughs> Without clay and knowledge, he cannot make a pot. These represent the two factors necessary in every act of creation, the material and efficient causes. Obviously, the potter must exist before a pot can be created. In the same way, Ishvara existed before the universe became manifest. In the beginning, there was only Ishvara. So, Ishvara is the source of all that exists, the cause for everything else, the uncaused cause. And just as a potter must have sufficient knowledge to make a pot, Ishvara must have had sufficient knowledge to create everything. He must have had all knowledge. Therefore, we call Ishvara omniscient, possessing all knowledge as the intelligent cause for the universe. Swamiji asked Richard, what about the material cause? The material cause was envisioned by the Rishis in a most remarkable way. Swami Dayananda replied, look at this. The potter had a supply of clay the raw materials for the pot, but there was no such supply of raw materials for Ishvara. Before the world was created, Ishvara alone existed. Therefore, 
there could be no other source of material than Ishvara itself. Ishvara is both the intelligent and material cause for the universe. An interesting illustration of this is found in the Mundaka Upanishad that shows how a spider is both the intelligent and material cause for its web. A spider not only knows how to spin a web, but is also the source for the web's material. Whereas a potter has knowledge, but finds clay outside, the spider is the source of both knowledge and material for its web. This spider analogy is clever and helpful, but does not completely explain Ishvara's act of creation. It has one major defect. The spider can crawl away from its web, abandoning its own creation. Ishvara, on the other hand, is said to pervade the universe, a universe that remains non-separate from its creator. Ishvara did not create the universe and then leave on a holiday. <laughs> Swami Dayananda laughed loudly at his own joke before continuing. We need a better analogy. Perhaps the best is found in your dreams. When you dream, you create a dream world, dream people, dream trees, dream houses, and so on. You are the creator of your dream world. You are its intelligent cause because everything in your dreams is drawn from your experiences, your memories, your knowledge. And what about the material cause? Out of what is your dream world woven? Your dream creation is made from the stuff of thoughts, the stuff of experience. That stuff, of course, is your consciousness. Dream people, dream trees, dream houses, everything is made of your own consciousness. And that consciousness that is your essential nature, it is you. Therefore, you are both the intelligent and the material cause for your dream world. Nothing in your dreams exists separate from you. You pervade your dream creation as the consciousness from which it is made. In this way, Ishvara pervades the universe as the underlying reality from which it was manifest. Nothing exists separate from Ishvara. Just as your dream world is nothing but consciousness, this universe is nothing but Ishvara. In the verses I chanted, all heads, eyes and feet were said to be Ishvara's because Ishvara is the essence of their existence. Everything here, sentient and insentient, exists because it is made of Ishvara, so to speak. In that way, Ishvara pervades the universe. Whatever is, was, or will be, is non-separate from Ishvara. That is why, instead of saying there is one God, we more correctly say there is only God. How is that? <laughs> and we'll pause our reading there. Thank you for listening, everyone. What a wonderful chapter on the nature of Ishvara, the cosmic person, being not only the intelligent cause, but the material cause for all of existence. <laughs> Such a good chapter, says Don Suela. I agree. <laughs> Thank you, Shakira, for your heart, me. Aryom Tatsat. And Divinely Chosen, thank you for your cloud bread. Om Namo Bhagavate 
वासुदेवाय <laughs> Rita you ask a funny question What's a good day to post on the internet Well a wise person once said that the best time to plant a tree was 40 years ago The second best time is now <laughs> However apparently The most active date for social media is those which lie on Wednesdays. The hump day for some reason. Videos just get more engagement. More people seem interested to click on new content. And Bobby so thank you for your heart me. Team bracelet and to cheer you up jai sita ram nati you ask how to deal with anger without suppressing it by being patient with it let it pass through you but let yourself not be moved by it feel that anger as if you were just holding it if you are marinating in the anger <laughs> let it pass through you refrain from making any decisions until that anger has passed and if anyone is asking for you to make a decision while you are angry or implying for you to perform some action then you can tell them that Right now I am feeling angry. When I am feeling more calm, perhaps we can continue this. And I am sure that they'll understand. <laughs> I think if anyone said that to me, I'd be like, "Okay. <laughs> Understandable." Marcy you ask do I drink soda or seltzer <laughs> Sometimes I wonder where you get your questions from Well I don't not drink soda or seltzer if someone offers it to me then Out of courtesy I will accept it But generally my first choice for a beverage is some nice juice I just love juice apple juice cranberry juice orange juice you name it <laughs> if that's not available water is fine Rita you were wondering what language was i speaking after i accepted gift language is sanskrit a very ancient language which you already know <laughs> and anna marques you ask how can breathing help returning to your breath can take your awareness away from the triggering events at hand reminding you that pranayama breath control is something meaningful to engage in that is within your free will at all times the breath has an intimate connection with our nervous system when someone is agitated you may find that they are breathing irregularly or shallowly um or rapidly or abruptly any of these things can also be conducive to being agitated and so conversely engaging in deep smooth consistent circular breathing can also engage the parasympathetic nervous system into a relaxed state 
that can very much help when you are practicing patience for the anger to pass. And I agree, Azulia. It's not easy. <laughs> no, everything meaningful requires effort. And I agree, Aquarius lady. That can be hard to do at times. <laughs> and what an understatement that is. It is almost rarely easy until you've had a lot of practice. Emily, you add to the conversation that anger causes resentments, which in turn leads to self-destructive behaviors. That's very true. Keeping an awareness for the outcome of anger can help us mitigate the cause, reminding ourselves that anger usually leads to more problems we have to solve rather than reducing the problems. <laughs> Cole, you ask, do I think that souls are finite? I believe they are infinite. By definition, they must be boundless in order to experience the bounded, the finite in comparison. If it were finite, then Consciousness would have to have some criteria for it. It could be seen somewhere and not in other places. But that would mean that there's some quality of consciousness which varies over space or time. Having that quality of variation implies that it's an object of our experience. Because it is precisely the objects of experience that fit that criteria of having some varying quality in which other objects can compare themselves to. But consciousness, or the soul, being the subject of objects, implies that it is different from objects, categorically, and therefore it cannot have qualities like other objects, such as some varying property. Therefore, it must not have a place. Whereas objects can be found anywhere, consciousness is found nowhere. Or equivalently in some perspective, everywhere. <laughs> Whereas objects have a beginning and an end, consciousness is never. And yet, at the same time, in another perspective, always eternal. Does this mean that souls don't have their own limitations well from another perspective they still can be limited for instance even if the soul is infinite mathematically we know that there are bigger infinities than others and there is no largest infinity so having an infinite soul means that there is still room for growth there is still larger infinities for it to maybe expand into shall we say, but that doesn't necessarily imply that it's finite. No, no, no. <laughs> Thank you, Jared, for your heartbeat a few minutes ago. Aryom Tatsat and Echo Leave. Thank you for that, Swan. I'm not sure if you still don't want me to, uh, to take the time to thank you for your gifts, but I appreciate your presence here nonetheless. Jai Sita Ram. Darling Devin, you asked, where did I learn Sanskrit? Well, I'm still learning it, but there are many wonderful online resources. The internet is a treasure trove for anything you want to learn, really. And thank you for asking, Starfire. I am doing well. And that's quite all right, Jared. Thank you for popping in to say everyone is beautiful. So lovely. And hello, Luz Reyes. <laughs> if 
pardon me. <laughs> and Anna, you had asked, what is circular breathing? Circular breathing means that you transition to each part of your breath very smoothly. There isn't any pauses. So your exhale flows very smoothly into your inhale. This might be in comparison to square breathing. Square breathing has its uses, particularly in uh, yoga. But if you're just coming to relaxation, it's best to do circular breathing, where you aren't holding your breath in or out. There's just a, a cycle of it ongoing without any, any sharp corners, any edges to it. And hello, Bing. <laughs> I do remember seeing your username before. And Cole, you share that you guess the eternal part of the soul is what trips you up. Yes. See, with the mind, of course, the mind has a beginning and an end. And if we try to think, that is, use the faculties of the mind, then we'll naturally see that everything in our experience has a beginning and an end, like our body, our memories, our talents, our beliefs, even qualities of our personality. They all have a beginning and an end. But the experiencer itself, that did not have some beginning nor end. How could it? Because a beginning and an end is something that you can experience and you can't experience yourself as the experiencer. As the experiencer, you can only experience that which is within your experience. But you are without, so to speak, separate from the objects of experience. And Natty, you had asked how to cope with grief and loss. My biggest recommendation would be to allow yourself to grieve that loss. That is how we process it. And no amount of pain can prevent you from being whole. In fact, the more pain we allow ourselves to experience, I should clarify, I don't mean the more pain you undergo, I mean the more we allow ourselves to feel pain, then the more whole we are. Because if we feel I shouldn't be feeling this sensation right now, then we close ourselves off from an experience. Even pain can be a valuable experience, and it is if you let it. But that conscious choice has to come naturally. No one can teach you. You have to surrender yourself and see by your own eyes that you are growing from this experience, even if it is painful. And hello, Paul. And thank you for your hand hearts a few moments ago. Ariom Tatsa. Aquarius lady, you share that your ducks are going to have babies. That is very exciting. And thank you, Anav, for your blessings. Much the same back to you. And Dali Mama, thank you for your quintet of finger hearts a few minutes ago. Radhi, Radhi. And Anna, you clarify. So it is the opposite of when you inhale, pause, exhale, pause. I wouldn't say opposite, because there still can be pauses. There is just isn't a sharp um, demarcations between each part of your breath. What makes a circle a circle is that it seems equal all around. Similarly, make your breath very equal. Let its cycle be very smooth and periodic. And hello, Michelle Ramey. And thank you, Nina Shine. 
<laughs> and Azulia, you had asked how to handle sadness. Sadness is also a very beautiful part of our experience. I'm so grateful for all the sadness and heartbreak that I've experienced because it's proof that I've lived and lived so deeply and fully. Handle sadness. We use the word handle in a couple of ways. As a noun, it might refer to that which we grab onto so we can control a certain tool. But handling sadness is all about letting go rather than grabbing on. It is all about surrendering to rather than controlling. If tears flow, let yourself cry. If you feel like you need some time to process and you can't be engaged in your responsibilities, then that is time you should take to process that sadness rather than come to the conclusion that it's the sadness that needs to go away. Rather, it's yourself needing to go away from your responsibilities so that you may process that sadness. And little wing Nico, thank you for your heart me a few minutes ago. Sky Guardian, you ask, did I ever open the wrapping of In Love at Ease or is it still in the wrapper until we start? It's a good question. It's behind you all. Let me look. It's still in its wrapper. <laughs> Fifinka, you ask, do I believe in Anunnaki? I have heard this word before many times, but I have yet to experience the meaning of this word in this life. Your, uh, your intuition was correct, Sky Guardian. Hello, Kenny G. <laughs> Veronica, you ask, can I explain seeing entities in two dimensions? Any knowledge of that? Well, if we lived in a two-dimensional universe, one that had only left and right and forward and backwards, if it had no up or down, that wasn't even a concept, someone asked you, what's above you? You'd say, what is above? I don't understand. I only know up. Sorry, I mean, I only know forward, backward, left, and right. Similarly, our field of view would only be able to encompass left and rightness. You'd be only able to see color and brightness to the left or to the right. There'd be no vertical part of your vision. In other words, you'd see just a line segment, and it's in that line segment that you'd see different colors and shapes, just as how us in three dimensions have eyes which each see a whole plane of experience. In 3D, we see in 2D, and in 2D, we'd see in 1D. <laughs> That's fun to think about. The, uh, the book and the movie Flatland as a great the, uh, exploration of what it would be like to live as 2D creatures. And hello, Alice. <laughs> and hello, Joanna. Happy Monday. And thank you, Michael, for your quintet of roses. Arion Tatsa. Katie, you ask, if the universe is predicted to one day end, will consciousness be locked away, unable to be moved by a vehicle, aka life or body? Let me tell you something that will flip your perspective inside out. Consciousness 
is not a part of the universe. The universe is a part of consciousness. Consciousness is not moved by the body. The body is moved by consciousness. Your question is the same as asking, when the movie ends, what will happen to the movie screen? Simple answer, nothing happens to the movie screen because the movie screen was not a part of the movie. The events of the movie happen inside the movie screen. All the movement happens through the movie screen. The movie screen never moves the whole time. That is consciousness, as the space in which this experience takes place, and not one of the things that's a part of the experience. So when the universe ends, that's just like the movie coming to an end. Consciousness has been there since before the universe began. <laughs> and it will remain the Alpha and the Omega. Veronica, you share. Yeah, that just gives me more questions. LOL. <laughs> good, good. Melissa, you ask. Hello. Do I like Lao Tzu? Taoism or Tao Te Ching? I don't know, but why don't we read a bit about Taoism from Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching? <laughs> Let us read number 25. Before creation, a presence existed, self-contained, complete, formless, voiceless, mateless, changeless, which yet pervaded itself with unending motherhood, though there can be no name for it. I have called it the way of life. Perhaps I should have called it the fullness of life, since fullness implies widening into space, implies still further widening, implies widening until the circle is whole. In this sense, the way of life is fulfilled, heaven is fulfilled, Earth is fulfilled, and a fit person is also fulfilled. These are the four amplitudes of the universe. A fit person is one of them. Person rounding the way of Earth, Earth rounding the way of Heaven, Heaven rounding the way of life till the circle is full. It's Pidge. Thank you for that heart me a few minutes ago. Hari Om Tat Sat. <clears throat> and hello, Luna Moon Child. You share that your partner died a week ago, and you just wish that he watches over you. That reminds me. And thank you for sharing that. I know that you have been here since before that change in your life took place. So I welcomed you before. I welcome you now, especially. Thank you for being here. And that reminds me of a short story of a man who went up to a wise person 
And the man said, I am so despondent. My wife of many years has died. I am absolutely crushed, my soul shattered. What am I to do? The wise person said, Do you love your wife very much? The man said, of course, with all my heart. The wise person asked, did she love you? The man said, of course, with all her heart. He asked, do you think that your wife would have been crushed just the same if you were the one to leave rather than her. The man said, yes. In fact, perhaps she would be even more despondent than I would. I don't know how she would be able to carry her grief. The wise person then said, Therefore, you have given your wife a great blessing by being here today. Outliving her, you have given her the gift of being with them until her last moments. Never will she have to go through what it's like to not be with you. By bearing her suffering, you are continuing to love her with this blessing provided to her. And with that, the man realized that he was still able to love from beyond the grave, that even though he had lost his wife, he had gained this opportunity to bear her suffering so that she doesn't have to. And suddenly that sadness gained so much meaning. And now there was a reason to hold it and be with it. But much love to you, Luna Moon Child. And no, there are no words that are going to remedy the heart's tears. But allowing your heart to cry, now that is a gift you can give yourself. Thank you, Michael, for your GG and ice cream cone a few minutes ago. <laughs> Radhi, Radhi. And thank you, Katie Pond, for your rose and friendship necklace. Jai Sita Ram. Now, do you ask? How to let go of pain from parents? By recognizing that it's not yours. Consider, for example, if you had children, yes, being your, um, your child, you would want them to inherit all of your virtues, all of the th parts of yourself that you hold dear to yourself. Maybe they would take their own spin on it, sure, but all the good parts of you, you absolutely want them to be inherited. But all of your misfortune, all of your bad habits, that's not something you would wish on your child, right? There isn't a parent in the world that would want that for their children. 
However, somehow children still get these bad habits from their parents, their pains, generational trauma, even though it wasn't their parents' intention. And perhaps it helps to remember this, that even if conflict arose in childhood from your parents, at the dawn of your birth, and even before, never was there an intention to pass on pain. Knowing this to be the case, we can forgive our parents for what have transpired after that intention was set and come to embrace their original purpose of bringing us into this life and taking what they have learned and growing from there. And thank you, David, for your rose. Aryum Tatsa and Nish, thank you for your heart, me. Jai Sita Ram, and good night, Luz Reyes. Christopher, you're wondering, why don't I post videos anymore? <laughs> Well, you are welcome to check out the link tree in my bio. There I have a frequently asked questions page and I give you a full answer there. Pardon me. <laughs> and Liz. Thank you for that heart, me. Radhe, oh Radhe. And Marie. Thank you for your tiny, tiny. Nippy. And a bubble tea. Jai Sita Ram. And you like my water bottle, Mary? It has, uh, it has, uh, math stuff on it and physics. The whole universe is inside it. my throat okay asks Anna it is okay it seems that every time I light incense I end up breathing it in <laughs> good to remember Sky Guardian you are wondering what page we are on in Roar the Ganges 290 and thank you Jen Seng for your confetti Aryum Tatsa It's a pizza, you ask? Can I explain to you what an Ishta Devata is? A personal deity? Consider that we all are unique in our personalities and each of us look up to different kinds of role models since we all are growing in our own unique ways the ways in which we look up to others is just as unique similarly all the parts of that infinite source which we would like to become ourselves those parts of the source we personify as our personal form of God. For example, someone might be insecure of their intelligence, and so they look at God as maybe a, a wise old woman. Because wisdom is something that they would like to inherit from their source. So maybe their Ishta Deva is a wise old woman. Another person, maybe they're struggling with um, they're struggling with 
with being in pain. And so they want to look up to the source as a shepherd, perhaps, an all caring shepherd who isn't going to let any of their sheep get lost. And so that comforts them to personify the source in that way. As such, an Ishta Deva is precisely this concept. It is what you need in a source. You look up to the source that way, and that's your Ishta Deva. You can choose from the many that already exist, or you can describe your own. And this is why there are so many forms of God. There's one form of God for every individual on Earth. Probably more if there's aliens out there too. Some become really powerful. Some people are better at imagining the form of God. So people go to those people and go, Hey, can I borrow your Ishta Deva? How do you envision God? Maybe I could learn from you. <laughs> And then the really famous of those end up spawning religions around them. <laughs> but at its heart, religion is always a personal endeavor of how we connect to that source within our own unique personality and needs. But no form in particular is absolute, since each form is reflective of, of, each our, of our needs, and all of our needs vary from person to person. The absolute itself is formless, infinite in all extent. And thank you, Mary, for your bouncing beach volleyball <laughs> and quintet of roses. Now I have to solve a puzzle if you're wondering. I failed the puzzle, I must not be real. Okay, let me try again. There, sometimes TikTok doesn't believe that I'm real. <laughs> So I have to solve a puzzle to confirm. But yes, thank you, Mary. I don't know if the sound effect was louder than my voice, but thank you for that bouncing beach volleyball and quintet of roses. Sarah B, you ask, can I pray for your mom. Her name is Tanya. <laughs> of course. All of my best wishes go out to Sarah's mother, Tanya. And may she have the courage to face everything she is going through, both within and without. And for you, Sarah B., I pray that you discover how awesome your mom is in ways that you will learn as you continue to grow and how the eternal mother has been playing the character as your mom. <laughs> so humble she disguises herself as many different mothers. But that Divine Mother is all-pervading and will be with you always. Vachanam Brut Time, says Sky Guardian. As you wish, let us. <laughs> Here we will be reading the Vachanam Brut which is a collection of about 300 discourses from Swami Narayan, who in the turn of the 19th century was a great being who was revered by many different spiritual lineages, especially the BAPS from where we get this version of the Vachana Murut. Today we are going to be reading Gadhada 1.26 A genuine 
amorous devotee, amorous, and the nirguna state, the formless state. As will become obvious, this book has a lot of direct teachings, often with a lot of uh, unambiguous terminology, ripe with a lot of Sanskrit. So it can be a bit technical and sometimes overwhelming. <laughs> but I'll do my best to interpret it as authentically as I can, given my limited experience. On the afternoon of Posh, Sudhi the 11th, Samvat 1876, or the 27th of December, 1819, Swami Narayan, here addressed as Sriji Maharaj, was sitting on a large decorated cot on the veranda outside the east-facing rooms of Dada Kachar Tarbar in Gadhada. He had tied a white pug around his head. He was wearing a white case and had covered himself with a thick white cotton cloth. Two large Guldavadi Flowers had been placed upon his ears, and a tassel of flowers had been inserted in his pug. At that time, while some Paramahansas, high kinds of renunciants, were singing devotional songs to the accompaniment of Atal and Pakwaj, other Paramahansas as well as devotees from various places had gathered before him in an assembly. The Paramahansas, oh, I skipped a verse, Sriji Maharaj then said, Now, please stop singing and listen as I sing a devotional song in the form of a discourse. The Paramahansas said in return, very well, Maharaj. Please do. Thereupon, Sri Ji Maharaj said, If while singing amorous devotional songs, a person is attracted only by God's form, then that is fine. But being attracted to anything except God's form constitutes some major deficiency. Why? Because just as that devotee develops affection for and is attracted by sounds related to God, they also develop affection for and is attracted by worldly songs, musical instruments, talks related to romantic partners, etc. Such a devotee should be known to lack wisdom. Thus, a person who is attracted to an equal extent by the words of that source, God, and his son, saint, and by worldly speech should forsake such foolishness. Having forsaken such foolishness, they should experience happiness through sound and speech related only to that ultimate source, God. Such a person is a genuine, amorous devotee. Furthermore, just as that devotee wishes for sounds related only to God, they desire the touch only of God. When they realize other types of touch to be like touching a black cobra or a blazing fire, then they are genuine a Morris devotee. Similarly, if a person experiences profound bliss on seeing God, realizing everything else to be like a pile of filth or a decomposing dog, then they are a genuine amorous devotee. <laughs> Similarly, if a person experiences profound bliss on tasting the prasad, the uh, food offered to God, 
not enjoying the various other types of tastes, then they are a genuine, amorous devotee. Furthermore, such a devotee experiences profound bliss on smelling tulasi, garlands of flowers, sandalwood paste, and the many varieties of fragrant perfumes, etc., that have been offered to God. They are not pleased on smelling the perfume, sandalwood paste, or garlands of flowers worn by materialistic people. In this manner, a person who has intense love for God related vishais, experiences of the senses, and an intense aversion for worldly vishais, is a genuine amorous devotee. On the other hand, a person who becomes an amorous devotee and yet derives the same pleasure from other types of sight, sounds, smells, tastes, and touch, as they do from God-related vishais, is a false amorous devotee. One second. All right, I had to pause the cough. Thank you. <laughs> Why? Because they experience the same type of joy from Vishais as they do from God. Therefore, such amorousness and mode of worship should be forsaken. Why? Because it is not God who is at fault, it is the amorous devotee's attitude that is at fault, i.e., they have believed God to be exactly like other objects. As a result, their bhakti, their devotion, and amorousness is flawed. Now, just as I has, have described discretion in indulging the five types of vishais, experiences of the senses, of sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch, for the stool body in the waking state, similarly, subtle vishais exist for the sukshama body in the dream state. A devotee may experience happiness from God-related sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and touch on seeing the form of God in their dream. But if they also derive exactly the same pleasure on seeing other vishais, experiences of the senses, in their dream, then that devotee's amorousness is false. If, on the other hand, a person in their dream experiences happiness only by association with God and feels an aversion for other vishais, as if they were vomited food, then they can be said to be a genuine amorous devotee. <laughs> if they do not experience this, then although the form of God seen in their dream is true, that devotee's understanding is flawed. Why? Because they have equal love for God and other vishais. Thus, true understanding is to remain attracted only towards the form of God and not towards other vishais. In this way, when only thoughts of God remain while contemplating, a state of void is attained wherein, with the exception of the form of God, that devotee does not perceive the body or the Brahmanand, the universe, at all. Thereafter, while seeing the form of God within that void, divine light is generated and the form of God is seen within that light. So. Affection towards only the form of God in this manner is called faithful bhakti, devotion. In conclusion, Sri Ji Maharaj added, When you sing amorous devotional songs, I also close my eyes and think about just this. These thoughts of mine may be simple, but nothing is able to persist in those thoughts except God. In fact, so powerful are my thoughts that 
if any Vishai were to obstruct the amorous love that I have for God's form, it would be decapitated. Just as you sang devotional songs, I have also sung a devotional song in the form of this discourse, which I have shared with all of you today. In this way, using himself as an example, Sri G. Maharaj delivered this discourse for the benefit of his devotees. And thus we conclude Gadhada 1.26. on a genuine amorous devotee and the nirguna state, the formless, that void state that was mentioned. So thank you again for listening. <laughs> and thank you, Asma, for your heart me. Aryom Tatsat and good night Katie Pond. And I am always so happy when you polite folk also say good night to those who say good night and engage with each other in such wholesome ways. It makes me happy. And Edmo, thank you for your heart me. And Octet of Roses. Aryom Tatsat. Gardening Gregarji, you ask if I know about Shintoism and what if we did a Shinto prayer for mantra one day? Well, since you all have been mentioning Shintoism intermittently, I have been doing some immersing in the culture of Shinto. It's a beautiful tradition and uh, yes, we can do a Shinto prayer for mantra one day. I love that idea. Thank you for suggesting it. I'm all for cross-cultural communication and interfaith dialogues. I think that will definitely spark some overlap between various spiritual lineages. And thank you, Michael, for your rose and heart me. Sasquatch, you ask, how come I won't answer your question? Well, I was reading the last few minutes from the Bajana Amrut, but now I am open to uh, receiving questions again. If I scroll up, I don't seem to see your question, so I don't know if it was filtered. But you are welcome to relay it to me, and if it is appropriate, I will gladly answer it. Julia, you ask, what do I think about cheating in a relationship? There are many factors which are important to consider, and each of them deserve a kind of carefulness because it is a sensitive topic for so many people. I think the first thing to acknowledge is that there is real suffering. When people feel betrayed, that suffering it's definitely something that deserves to be attended to with love and care. Ultimately, that suffering comes in two kinds. The first kind is that feeling of being betrayed, that they have done something disloyal. They have broken our trust, our sacred bond. And that part of the suffering, the other person should take accountability for. But the second part of the suffering is something that we have power over and that we may feel insecure by the fact that part of their needs were not fulfilled by us, that they went looking for some satisfaction in a place that we could have potentially provided for them. And that side of the suffering is perhaps even more important because it's something that we can attend to directly. In any relationship, although that trust is an important thing to take accountability for, also we have to manage our expectations about having 
the understanding that we may not be able to provide all of the needs for someone or provide for all the needs of someone. And that isn't a reflection on your being. Sometimes people experience cheating and then they themselves feel like they did something wrong. <laughs> like they could have been more, uh, more than enough for them, but yet they weren't. So then they feel like a part of themselves is, is inadequate. And this kind of feeling is something that definitely deserves attending to. Understanding that you did nothing wrong. You are whole. At the same time, you can never expect yourself to satisfy all the needs of someone else. We can't be everyone's doctor, therapist, nutritionist, parent. Some roles do have to be fulfilled by others. And if those roles are assumed to be something that you can fulfill, when they go to fulfill those roles in other people, then that can be a break of trust. And it's important to discuss that before they go looking for satisfaction in other places. In a relationship, it is important to have healthy communication and if you feel like your needs are not satisfied the other by the other person then talk to them about that <laughs> there can be room for lots of different boundaries to be set and um, methods of coming to agreement on how we can satisfy each other's needs or or how we may be unable to and so it may be important to look elsewhere communication is so important otherwise everyone gets hurt and for what for a little bit of sensual gratification communication is although sometimes awkward definitely going to be much less awkward than trying to manage the pain that happens following <laughs> such absence of communication. And hello Gaia. Hello Loopy Lane. You share that. You have bipolar and insomnia. And my wise words bring you peace in your despair. For this you thank me. <laughs> well, that's very nice of you. I don't feel like there are any wisdom. There is any wisdom to be found in my words. There is wisdom in your experience. And if I am able to connect with you in your experience, then I hope you recognize that wisdom to be a part of you all along. Greetings, walking artist. Gaia, you ask, what if you state boundaries and break up? That's allowed. If a breakup follows from setting boundaries, then that goes to show that perhaps one or both of you need to Learn from it some solidarity of emotional support, some freedom from each other to learn how to respect those boundaries. Sometimes people draw their boundaries over yours. And so they might say or imply that you're crossing my boundaries, even though they're crossing yours. <laughs> And such is the case of, of the world also. A country will have a very clearly defined boundary, but then a neighboring country goes, let me just draw my boundary over yours. And suddenly they say, you're crossing my boundary. And the first country says, what the heck? <laughs> my boundaries were here all along. 
You can't just draw yours over mine and claim that you're crossing mine. Or that I'm crossing yours when you're actually crossing mine. Likewise, sometimes disputes in relationship end very similarly. Where each other thinks that they're crossing each other's boundaries, but we have to understand that we need to redraw the lines then, because your boundaries can't be overlapping each other. And if you are unable to come to an agreement, pardon me, then it is best for you to separate. At the same time, I would like to add that there is a lot of focus on relationships in the world. But the most important relationship we can cultivate is the one with ourselves. You don't need to be in a relationship to be happy. There are many people who are in a relationship and unhappy. <laughs> and there are many people who are single and happy. So sometimes the best recourse on relationship advice is to not bother. <laughs> Be happy being single for a while. And thank you, Michael, for your Rosa a few minutes ago. Aryom Tatsa. Now, if you're really serious about the spiritual path, you will find all the great spiritual beings that have been trailblazers. They have focused their love so one pointedly on everyone, rather than having some of their love allocated for a romantic partner. That is to say, the greatest spiritual potential is unlocked when you love everyone equally rather than having some of your love allocated towards one person and then disproportionately everyone else. Instead of marrying one person, why not marry the divinity itself, which exists within every person? Instead of deepening a connection with a particular person, deepen it with the consciousness that pervades all people. Then you feel like you are in the presence of your soul beloved everywhere you go. Your soul mate is the soul itself. The same soul in you, in me, and everyone else. And thank you, Maria, <laughs> for your pair of roses. Radhi, oh Radhi and divinely chosen. Thank you for your tiny tiny. Yahoo! Hello, Michaela. <laughs> and thank you for your heart me and four team bracelets to divinely chosen. Aryom Tatsat and Ragnhildur. Thank you for your trio of roses. And Jennifer, thank you for your TikTok. Hello, Haley. <laughs> Basilica, you're going to listen to this at the gym. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, I, I hear many people doing funny things while listening to this live stream. Some people like to cook. Some people like to uh, hold their baby in their arms until they fall asleep, which is one of the most wholesome things I've ever heard. 
Some people like to fall asleep, but you're working out, getting those gains on. Awesome. <laughs> And Kiro no, if you ask for advice on your friend who feels like it's hard to breathe and feels their life as suffocating. Mm. It's very, very visual the imagery they choose to describe it. Yeah. Feeling out of breath is very very symbolic. And feeling like you're surrounded by something that you can't expand into, that you're just contracting. That tells me that they still feel like they're in the world rather than the world being in them. The latter of which is more accurate from a philosophical perspective. Sometimes feel like we are surrounded by all this danger, but actually the danger is surrounded by us. What does that mean? It means that all this chaos, all this disorder is pervaded by you as consciousness. You are the very life essence in which this whole universe is strung like beads on a thread. But when we feel like we are part of the world, and naturally, we are suffocated. Because our life exists not in the world, but outside of it. This is the perspective we come to through Vedanta. like a movie. Haven't you all been watching a movie where a character goes underwater for a bit and then we ourselves hold our breath? Why do we do this? <laughs> Haven't you done this too? Character goes underwater or struggling to breathe so we ourselves feel like we're struggling to breathe. And then we start to wonder can I hold my breath for this long? <laughs> Is it cheating if I take a breath but the main character doesn't? <laughs> we do this because the point of the movie is for us to get lost in the plot. We enjoy all of the goings on or the going ons. as we project our sense of self into the protagonist. When the protagonist is sad, we feel like we're sad. When the protagonist is happy, we feel like we're happy. If the protagonist is afraid, we feel like we're afraid. Like when watching a horror movie. But sometimes we have to take that deep breath in and remember, What's going on in the movie isn't going on for me. The main character may be afraid, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I am afraid. The main character may be drowning, but that doesn't mean I am drowning. I am the witness of life, and that witness is unaffected by the happenings of the movie screen. Sky Guardian, you ask, can I play the video as an overlay? You have the perfect meditation. Well, right now, I've already set up the Sam Garrett and Molly Mendoza Asadoma Sadgamaya Mantra. So, perhaps tomorrow we can do the uh, 
a special overlay. That does sound fun. I'll have to set that up. I wouldn't be able to do that live, but definitely next time. And Jane, thank you for your dozen roses. <laughs> Arion Tat Sat. You're very welcome. Kiro Ronov. And JK, thank you for your heart, me. Jade, you ask, what to do when you think most people are not good people? There is no such thing as a good person. There is also no such thing as a bad person. There is also no such thing as a neutral person. So why do we call people good, bad, or anything in between and beyond? It's because we identify them with their history, their past, with their actions. And it is true that people must take accountability for their actions. It is what they are doing in the present that ultimately matters. Even if they have a terrible track record, if they are doing what's in their capacity to take accountability for it in this moment, then that is a good thing to do. We may label their actions as bad, good, or neutral, but how they are in the present moment is ultimately what matters. Therefore, we cannot simply label anyone as good, bad, or neutral as a whole, because who they are in this moment is always changing, and everyone has the capacity to do good now, or at the very least, to not do bad. <laughs> but never rule out that possibility. And Vaz High Roller, thank you for your heart, me. <laughs> and your two, 23, and 16 team bracelet. Thank you. And for your marvelous confetti. Greg RG, you share that if I have the video located in my stream lab or OBS, then I can play it any time though. This is true. However, the audio that we use for the mantra sessions are just streamed from my my uh, my web browser and I just allow the software to also listen in to the output of that software so it's really reading my desktop audio rather than storing the video itself if I wanted to use the video then I'd have to indeed load it into the software Love that for a style job. All we can do is be the best version of ourselves and hope it resonates. I love that. 22 Pluto, 22, you share you're so tired but your eyes won't close. <laughs> I've never heard of that. Sometimes I do feel the need for my eyes to be open, even when I'm trying to sleep. My eyes will just keep opening themselves. Why? I'll keep them closed. Uh, no, 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 close them. It's like they have a mind of their own. <laughs> I find sleep masks help with that. Jade, you share that you want to see good in everyone, but many disappoint you. 
Sounds like you disappoint yourself by expecting good in others rather than seeing the good. And that's a tricky catch. Looking for the good in others does not mean assuming that they're already good, because then we will end up disappointed. Because we already have that expectation for them. Rather, we have to get curious. We have to look. And see for ourselves, even if they are in the middle of an act that we might attribute as bad. In what way are they also doing something good? It may be hard to find, but it's always there. No person and no action by itself is all good or all bad. These are big labels which we cannot apply to so many different small things. Assume nothing about the other person and just observe. Where is the good? You will find it. Thank you, High Roller, for your baker's dozen worth of team bracelets. Haryom Tatsa. Amanda, you ask, how do you know that you love someone? Because we do nothing but love. Love is our only ability. <laughs> You have to ask, do I love someone? The answer is yes. You are love, and everything that enters your awareness, you love. To love is to simply be conscious of, but it can have many flavors. That love can take on the flavor of romance. That love can take on the flavor of nostalgia. That love can take on the flavor of hatred. Even hatred is a flavor of love. Because it means I'm so passionately aware of this person. <laughs> that is a kind of love. <laughs> Thank you, Nick, for your ten tiny dinies. Yippee! <laughs> the shadow, you ask? Oh, my apologies. I thought that was a question. I misread it. <laughs> Jessica, you ask, what is the meaning that everything you seek is within? The more inward you go, the lonelier it is. I'm glad you asked. Some people hear that and they go, okay. It must be true. So they repeat it to others. And then other people hear, okay. It must be true. But what is the real meaning of this fact? That everything you need is within. Some people hear the word within and they think, okay, it means I gotta shut the world out and enter in to this spaciousness that is beyond the experiences of the senses. And if you interpret it like that, of course you're going to feel lonely. <laughs> because within does not mean away from anything. It means within everything. It means within this experience, within you, within me.
there exists that potential within everything. Coming to find that potential is all that you need. You don't need to be anyone separate from who you are already. And as long as you are pursuing that potential within everything and everyone, including yourself, then that is all you need. Because you are not perfect when you are grown, nor when you are learned, healed. You are perfect in your awakening, in your growing, in your learning, in your healing. That continuous striving to unfold that potential within this moment, that is enough. Does that make sense? Hello, Chloe Evans. <laughs> the shadow you ask what is the sound of a hand clapping <laughs> damn gotta sleep <laughs> one hand clapping Surely it is no different than the sound that a tree makes when it falls in the forest and no one else is around to hear. I imagine those sound very similar. <laughs> and thank you, Michael, for your cap a moment ago. Ariom Tatsa Amanda, you ask, does love necessitate action or can it simply exist as a feeling? Love is spaciousness itself through which all actions exist. When you love someone, you are just there for them. You are just an open space for them to be in, for them to be unconditionally themselves. They may unfold in your presence and through that unfolding you may call action. But it was only waiting for that love. It didn't need it. In fact, you needed to witness it. So it was waiting for you. What do all these abstract words mean? I mean, that potential that exists within someone, it is not there for them. It is there for you to witness. It is waiting for the time that someone may hold space to love, for it to unfold so that you may become conscious of that beauty. And that is the universe's gift for you. The action is not caused in the same way that a person walking into a movie theater does not cause the movie to begin. The movie can play any time it wants, but it waits for you in order to begin playing. In the same way, there are many actions done out of love, but the cause for them was already there. It was only the time for that action to unfold that is decided 
by when love is there. And thank you for your good night wishes, Chloe Evan. All the same back to you. And thank you, Michael, for another cap. <laughs> Jai Sita Ram. And Mr. Rocket Shot, thank you for your heart me and team bracelet. Radhe, oh Radhe. Hello, Ethan Spicy Consciousness. Danielle, you share that you have been going through a rough path and wondering if I feel that things are getting better on your side. If you're going through a rough path, that must mean that you're a trailblazer. <laughs> See, if you want an easy path, just do what everyone else is doing. If you follow in their footsteps, you won't have to be bushwhacking. <laughs> but if you're on a path of self-discovery, then you're going to be in uncharted territory. That roughness is proof that you're going where someone hasn't gone before. And that is a sign of a good discoverer, a good adventurer, a good journeyer. And it is only a matter of time until you discover that what you are looking for. I'm VZJ, you ask, what do I think you're going through? <laughs> Well, I am not a mind reader. I can only infer based on what you tell me. But if you are like the rest of us, eight billion some people on this planet, you are struggling with austerity. That is to say, there are things that you know you should be doing but you don't want to be doing. We know that we have the free will to exercise for change. And yet we keep slipping into our old ways. Does that sound familiar to anyone? To everyone? <laughs> Welcome to the human experience. And thank you, Claire, for your friendship necklace. Orion Tatsa Nina, thank you for your rose. Jai Sita Ram. I'm busy, Jay. You share. There is someone you don't want to love. But you can't stop thinking about her. She hurts you so bad. Sometimes we give our whole heart without realizing that it's a lot easier to give than it is to take back. I have found that in our own heart, the space that we allocate for others that's a permanent deed. We can try to wrestle with that contract and convince ourselves to take that love away. But what's done is done. Fortunately, what we love is not the person itself, but something that we saw in that person.
if you take a close look at the contract signed by your heart. It says not, I shall love so and so forever. It says, I shall love these things I find in them forever. Recognizing that clause in the contract, you realize there's a loophole. You can find those same things in other places. Therefore, that allocation of your heart still gets to be utilized, just in a different way. For example, suppose that person you loved, one of the reasons you loved them was because they were so fond for animals. You just love that in them, that no matter where they were, if they walked by a dog or a cat or a cow or a horse, they would always stop and say hi. And that's one of the things in your contract. You love that. And now every time that you see an animal, you think of them and you think, Oh Lord, I cannot escape this absence in my heart. But then you realize, if by loving them, I was only empowering them to do the things that I saw in them. I can do those things too. Why don't I stop and say hi to that animal? Why don't I embody that part in them that I loved? Contract is still fulfilled. Heart gets to express that part of them. What we grieve is not that which we are missing out on loving, but on the particular form that that love should take. If you can separate the form of love from love, then there is no loss in heartbreak. <laughs> Good morning, Steve. Thank you to Ply for your heart me a moment ago. Haryom Tatsa. And Michael, thank you for your rose. Jai Sita Ram. Corina, you share that. You saw my comment which had this in it. Om. What does it mean? There, I said it out loud. Here, I'll show you. <laughs> Here, I can draw on my screen for you. Um, in Devanagri, which is a script used to render Sanskrit, for example, uh, you have this letter. This letter is A. Ah. A. Ah. And we also have another letter, which looks like this. This is U, U. And then over some letters, here I'll just put a fill in the blank, you might have a crescent moon and a dot above it. That's called a Chandra Bindu. Chandra means moon. Bindu means dot. Dot and moon. This makes it a pure nasalized sound. So, here, let's see if I can change the colors. If you take the first part of a, uh, the second part of U and the Chandra Bindu, then they form together this symbol. I'm running out of space. And that is 
Aum. You start with A, ah, transition quickly into U, and then you nasalize it with the Chandra Bindu. Um. Um. So that is what that symbol means. It's a ligature comprised of the Devanagari A, U, and Chandra Bindu. John F., thank you for your rose a few minutes ago. Hari Om Tat Sat Karina, you say, oh, like the sound used in yoga? Tatastu. Precisely. Yes. It's a very ancient, very sacred sound. Here, I'm going to blow all of your minds, but I'll have to do so with a lot of discretion. Um, before Devanagari was used to render Sanskrit, the oldest language we knew, uh, or script to render Sanskrit, was known as Brahmi. And Brahmi, the letter O, looked like this. And the Bindu. You'd put a dot right here. Now, if you really wanted to stylize this, you'd rotate four copies on itself, which ends up making the swastika, which although has been used in more recent times to represent Nazism, it was stolen from the Hindus and Buddhists for it was the original OM symbol. Fun fact. <laughs> and you can see why we have changed which symbol we use to render OM <laughs> primarily. <laughs> but that's a fun fact for you. And thank you, Joss, for your half dozen rosas. Now, I was going to read from another section of the pocket, Pema Chodran. This is a lovely book in which this Buddhist nun, Bhema, Bhema Jodran, has had some of her written works compiled into 108 sayings. Today, let us read from 92, A Magical Golden Key. Being satisfied with what we already have is a magical golden key to being alive in a full, unrestricted, and inspired way. One of the major obstacles to what is traditionally called enlightenment is resentment, feeling cheated, holding a grudge about who you are, where you are, and about making friends. Oh, I skipped a line. That definitely changes the meaning of this sentence. <laughs> Feeling cheated, holding a grudge about who you are, where you are, and what you are. This is why we talk so much about making friends with ourselves. because for some reason or other, we don't feel that kind of satisfaction in a full and complete way. Meditation 
is a process of lightening up, of trusting the basic goodness of what we have and who we are, and of realizing that any wisdom that exists, exists in what we already have. Our wisdom is all mixed up with what we call our neurosis. Our brilliance, our juiciness, our spiciness is all mixed up with our craziness and our confusion and therefore it doesn't do any good to try to get rid of our so-called negative aspects because in that process we also get rid of our basic wonderfulness we can lead our life so as to become more awake to who we are and what we are doing rather than trying to improve or change or get rid of who we are or what we're doing. The key is to wake up, to become more alert, more inquisitive and curious about ourselves. That's 92, a magical golden key. And thank you for listening. <laughs> I always love reading from Bhima Chodron. And thank you, Claire, for your pair of team bracelets a moment ago. Aryom Tatsa. Sky Guardian, you share that it's time to land the plane so I don't skip tomorrow. A good idea. Thank you for constraining me <laughs> Joanna Rubio thank you for your dozen roses Jai Sita Ram and Nene thank you for your heart me Aryom Tatsa and Isabella thank you for your finger heart Radhe, oh Radhe. And John F. Thank you for your heart, me. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. And Usha. Thank you for your hand hearts. Karina, you share that once you heard me say, once the soul desires nothing. It achieves everything. How do we practice this? By practicing gratitude, you ask. Gratitude is a great way to do this, indeed. See, we desire something when we realize we don't already have it. Or at least we think we've come to this conclusion. We feel like we are missing something. Gratitude can be a great way to recognize all the things that we are not actually missing. In this moment, I am already loved and cared for. I am already healing, growing. In this moment, I have so much possibility. This possibility is there for anything my heart so desires. Therefore, how can I be separate from anything when it's all right here with me right now? I am connected to everything that's possible already in this moment. Therefore, there is nothing I desire, for everything has arrived. And 
and Nick. Thank you for your 86 roses. That's my mental math. Tallies up. <laughs> Plus another 23. What is that? Making 99? <laughs> Wait, no. 86 plus 23 is 109. Thank you. <laughs> Radhe, Radhe. And Isabella. Thank you for your finger heart. Jai Sita Ram. And Rachel. Thank you for your rose. Aryom Tatsat. Nick, you ask, do I still do slash plan to do interviews? Of course. I just have yet to uh, been offered an interview in a while. <laughs> I've exhausted all my possible interviewers. <laughs> but if any of you know anyone, you're welcome to set me up. I am like your kitten. You can pick me up by the tuft of my neck and place me somewhere. Yes, thank you, Dan How you for your heart fiend. <laughs> now we will be landing the plane soon but before we do so there are a few things I'd love to go through with you the first is a question of the day the second is a short reading from Roar the Ganges and then lastly we'll be doing a meditation today on my mother's favorite mantra Thank you, Claire, for your quintet of team bracelets. And Peter, thank you for your rose. Jai Sitaram. And Tatva Masi, thank you for your quintet of roses, too. My question of the day for you is a little intricate, but I trust you understand. Why can vulnerability be freeing? Do take your time with this. Sometimes we feel like being vulnerable is a negative thing. But in what way can it actually be freeing? Especially when it comes to others who we feel safe to be vulnerable around. What is so freeing about that experience? You tell me. Momstar Shop, you share that you just popped in and in your head you asked what question of the day is, you wonder. <laughs> you have manifested it. And thank you, Lizzie Love, for your 19 roses too. Radhe, Radhe. Lex, you share that it's a release. So true. I like the way you put that. It does convey that feeling, doesn't it? And Phoenix, you share that it can show us our strength. That's so true as well. Yeah. Nick, you share that it's sort of like feeling bliss after a nice long cry. <laughs> yeah. Or if you become... A masterful crier. You can even start to feel that bliss during the outpour of tears. Cancel the internet. You share that it humbles you, helps you see with more clarity. So true. Yeah. It is very humbling. <laughs> Gardening Greg RG, you share that when you give up control, you grab hold of liberation. Whew. That's a powerful sentence. Someone write that down. Oh wait, you already did just now. <laughs> so now um, you share that it's freeing because we get to live authentically instead of masking, which takes so much energy. You always have answers that hit the nail right on the head can always count on you. And Amanda, you share 
that it's a freeing of emotions, you would say. You say, well, calma, calma roge, is how I'd pronounce it. <laughs> or maybe it's calma roge, calma rogue. Many ways I could pronounce your lovely name, but you share a wonderful answer. You no longer have to pretend. Very true. Pluto, you share. You have no answer today. That's okay. You shared earlier that you're having trouble sleeping. <laughs> you definitely don't have to exercise your intellect when you are falling into sleep. Take care of your mind. Be patient with it. Lex, you share that it's daring to be seen which is also liberating. Right you are. Everybody loves Raven. You share that letting go of ego makes one feel vulnerable. I like that. Yes. It's the ego that feels vulnerable because now you're not there to protect it. Right? <laughs> Michael, you share it's great, but you got to keep trying over the hard times. Indeed. John F., you shared, lets you know that we kind of need one another. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. Peter Schaefer, you shared, swimming through to now horizon. If that is a typo, it's the best typo in the universe. Perhaps it was to new horizons, but the now horizon is so much better. <laughs> In Mom Star Shop, you share it's freeing because it gives others permission to do the same, releasing an authentic expression. I love that observation. Rianon, you share that because it takes courage to share hidden parts of us, to unmask. Definitely. It's a let go, says Echo Leaf. That's a good way of putting it. A let go. Jade Monique, you share that being vulnerable, you allow yourself to feel compassion. Beautifully put. Thank you. There is no such thing as weakness. I love that, Lizzie Love. There is no such thing as weakness. So true. <laughs> and Jeffrey, thank you for that hand heart you sent a moment ago. Aryom Tatsa. And you ask, isn't life a dream? Sometimes it's more of a nightmare than a dream. <laughs> but the more you become a lucid dreamer, the more fun it gets. And Danielle, thank you for your rose. Radhe, Radhe. And Mom Star Shop, thank you for your quartet of roses. Jai Sita Ram and Giggles Mekaha. <laughs> Thank you for your rose. Corina, you shared that you think it's really freeing knowing that most people just want to feel accepted like ourselves. That's so freeing, isn't it? Yeah, we're all just waiting to be accepted. Yet we all have our conditions for acceptance. <laughs> And Ragnhildur, you share that it's an act of bravery that is freeing. And Christine Bailey, you ask, but what happens when someone you love passes away? What is the answer to that? It is open-ended, isn't it? Who is to say what happens to that energy in which they were? 
what form it will take next. But what I do know is that that love never passes away. That love between you two will keep growing even from beyond the grave. Isn't it so? Your relationship with them is still evolving, still changing. It's now happening from within, primarily. And Isabella, thank you for your quartet of roses. And thank you everyone for exploring my question of the day today. I always look forward to your lovely responses. You open my mind so much. It is a miracle to have such wise beings such as yourself here before me. I am humbled by your presence. Now there are certainly many ways in which vulnerability is freeing and we could probably discuss this until what is it until the cows roll over what what's the saying I don't know <laughs> but before we go we will be doing two other things a reading from more of the Ganges and then we'll be doing a mantra until the cows come home oh that's it not until they roll over yeah <laughs> <laughs> I like until they roll over. Why don't we make that a thing? <laughs> until then, let us read from another section of Roar the Ganges. We're very close to finishing this. Here we are learning what it's like to be a Swami now, to be a Hindu monk. who has renounced the world and has completely dedicated themselves to spiritual awakening. I listened carefully as Swami Dayananda delivered his clear and powerful teachings about Ishvara in response to Richard's questions. This is the kind of teaching that first attracted me to Vedanta in general and to my guru, Swami Dayananda, in particular. I discovered then, for the first time, the tremendous difference between a teacher and a preacher. I had listened to many lectures by prominent religious and spiritual figures who passionately exhorted us to accept a particular doctrine or point of view. They were preachers, determined to persuade us to believe what they believed. But a teacher, on the other hand, has no such agenda. Teachers of mathematics or history do not want to inculcate in their students particular beliefs about algebra or World War II. A teacher's role is to make a student understand. A teacher imparts knowledge, not beliefs. And that is the role of a spiritual teacher as well. After all, the word guru means teacher not preacher. Access to an authentic guru was crucial for my spiritual growth. As a teenager, I completely rejected my childhood religious beliefs. I developed an allergy, so to speak, to religion and to preaching. Later in college, I was trained to think logically and scientifically. I was taught that truth should be based only on scientific observations. What could not be observed was relegated to the domain of theory or fantasy. Theory, if it seemed plausible. Fantasy, if it did not. <laughs> 
science and logic became my only authorities. I dismissed anything falling outside the umbrella of silence. Science, rather, and logic as irrational and false. With this background, it is hardly surprising that I began my spiritual quest without belief in God. I prided myself in being an agnostic. I had concluded, quite logically I thought, that God was unknowable. I also felt that prayer and devotion were pointless. According to my reasoning, how can you pray to an unknown God? I was fond of a joke about an eccentric church that rejected conventional beliefs about God and whose members purportedly started their prayers with, to whom it may concern. <laughs> my child agnosticism stood in stark contrast to my devout beliefs as a child when I attended Mass in a cavernous Catholic church adjacent to the para I have never seen this word parochial parochial grade school I attended from first grade onwards kneeling in a pew at that tender age my chin did not even reach to the top of the pew in front of me the nuns who taught our daily religion class said that our church was the house of God. I felt duly awed each time I entered. Its wooden beam soared high into the air, framing tall stained glass windows through, through which the morning light filtered. Behind the altar was a massive crucifix with a larger-than-life wooden figure of Jesus pinned to its cross pieces, gazing down upon us with sorrowful eyes. The High Mass in those days, before the reformations of the Second Ecumenical Church Council, Second Ecumenical Council, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right either, in the 1960s, was celebrated as it had been for the past 1,000 years. It was a dramatic display of ritual pageantry and mysterious observances. The mass opened with a professional hymn thundered from a colossal organ. With a processional hymn thundered from a... Oh, I, I just read that twice. <laughs> I'm really screwing up reading today, aren't I? Notes rained from its hundreds of pipes. The lowest pitches shook the floor and made my stomach queasy. The priest entered from the back of the church, adorned in richly embroidered silk vestments. He walked down the central aisle in solemn procession, accompanied by an assisting priest carrying a crucifix and four altar boys carrying candles. How I envied those altar boys, but I was too young then to assume that holy responsibility. The Mass itself was a feast for the senses, rows of tall candles on golden stands, fragrant incense, ringing bells, and the choir's harmonious chanting of the Latin liturgy. The congregation of hundreds sang hymns, sometimes joyous but more often poignant and melancholy. All of this had a profound effect on my impressionable mind. The Mass's grandeur and worship of God was exhilarating and intoxicating to me. Sometimes I was moved to tears. Many times I felt God's inexplicable presence, the greatness, his goodness, as though I had been touched by the finger of God. As I grew older, my feelings of awe and wonder faded along with my childish image of God as an old man with a white beard and flowing robes sitting on a golden throne amidst the clouds in heaven, surrounded by leagues of saints and angels. My juvenile beliefs it disappeared along with other childhood fantasies like beliefs in Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy, but as these beliefs faded, 
no new beliefs or image of God arose to fill that gap. By the time I was a young adult, I had become skeptical of anything that could not be directly experienced or scientifically proved. I dismissed religion as a naive delusion for people who needed a belief to cling to for security. Karl Marx's Opiate of the Masses. I considered myself fortunate to be free of such beliefs. I lived in a godless, mechanical world governed impersonally by the laws of physics. For me, life had no meaning. Nothing transcended the mundane reality and futility of lives inevitably ending in suffering and death. I lived in that cold, godless world for twenty years until Vedantic teachings led me to discover a new vision of God, of Ishvara, a vision to replace my childhood notions. This new vision was founded not on belief, but on understanding. In retrospect, I see how my prior worldview had grown so narrow that I could not see beyond my own limited concepts. It was as though I was standing before an exquisite painting with my nose almost touching the canvas so that all I could see were blobs of color and tiny cracks on the dried paint. From that perspective, I could never appreciate the beauty of what was before me. I had to step back and see the whole picture. I had to recognize that logic and science were not the sole authorities for what is real. The scope of their validity extends only to worldly matters. The existence of Ishvara lies beyond their reach. I never returned to my childhood belief in God as a master overseer who controls the universe from his heavenly abode like a supreme puppet master. Instead, through the teachings of the Vedic Rishis, I gained a sense of Ishvara's immediate presence in the world and in my life. I came to recognize Ishvara as the intelligence pervading the universe the natural order governing all, and I recognized Ishvara as the underlying reality or fabric upon which the world has been woven. Initially, these were just concepts to me, abstractions that I grasped intellectually like any other idea, but over a period of time my understanding grew in ways I never expected. Many people sense Ishvara's presence when inspired by great beauty, a flowery alpine meadow surrounded by snow-capped peaks, inspired soul-stirring music, the majestic architecture of magnificent cathedrals and temples. In India, I was overwhelmed again and again by this sense of Ishvara's presence when visiting ancient temples. But it was not their towering spires or ornate sculptures that invoked this feeling. Rather, I felt deeply moved when standing in the presence of what I perceived as profoundly sacred. The innermost chamber of every Hindu temple encloses a sacred form known as a murti, an icon or a deity that represents Ishvara in a particular manner. Some temples enshrine Lord Shiva in the form of Nataraja, the cosmic dancer engaged in the dance of creation and destruction. In other temples, Lord Vishnu is represented reclining on a bed 
at the bottom of the ocean, effortlessly sustaining the entire universe, in still other temples, Goddess Lakshmi's outstretched hands bestow blessings for prosperity and happiness. These and other temples are the devotional focal point for many of India's 700 million Hindus. Devoted worshippers can sense Ishvara's sacred presence in each of the deities enshrined in the temples. The sanctity of each deity is not created by the artisan who sculpted the stone form or cast the metal figure. Such artisans create only beauty, not holiness. But the deities are not simply works of art. They are consecrated forms, forms in which Ishvara's presence has been specially evoked. After a temple's construction is complete, an elaborate multi-day ceremony is performed in which the temple structure and the deity within are purified and dedicated for worship. Special mantras are recited to symbolically invest the deity with Ishvara's living presence. Unique rituals are performed in which life is breathed into the deity and its eyes are opened. The rites of consecration culminate with a priest climbing to the very top of the temple to pour sanctified water on the spire rising over the sacred chamber below. Perhaps worshippers themselves also have the power to specially invoke Ishvara's presence in a particular place or form. Wherever worship has been conducted for centuries, be it an old church, temple, mosque, or synagogue, many people can feel a divine presence there. Perhaps the fervent prayers of generations of worshippers have helped sanctify these places, saturating them with holiness. When I entered temples where daily worship had continued for over a thousand years, I felt Ishvara's sacred presence intensely, almost palpably. My experience in such temples was radically different from visiting beautiful monuments in India, like the Taj Mahal. In spite of the Taj's architectural perfection and aesthetic, its splendor did not inspire me as ancient temples did. The Taj Mahal is, after all, a mausoleum, an unbelievably, um, unbelievably extravagant burial crypt built by the Moghul ruler Shah Jahan for his wife Mumtaz. The Taj Mahal is a monument expressing a man's love for his wife. To visit the Taj Mahal just once was enough for me, but. I have returned to many temples again and again for Ishvara's darshan, to see and be in the presence of Ishvara. And with that, we'll pause our reading there for now as we conclude this chapter. Next time, we will apparently be discussing the worship of the formless that which is beyond all the forms, the murtis. So I thank you all for listening. And thank you, Isabella, for your quartet of roses that you sent whilst I read. Radhe, Radhe. And Shelley Wheeler, thank you for your heart me and team bracelet Jai Sita Ram Finally before we conclude today's Sangha we will be doing a mantra recitation if you are interested Before then allow me to extend my gratitude to Claire who also sent a team bracelet another team bracelet a heart me an ice cream cone a friendship necklace 
and another team bracelet. Jai Sita Ram and Isabella. Thank you for your rose. Aryom Tat Sat and a finger heart from you. And thank you, Hey Alexa, for your rose as well. As I mentioned before, today we are going to be doing my mother's favorite mantra, although a slight variation. This one is more sing-songy by uh, the musician Sam Garrett and Molly Mendoza. But it is still just as wonderful. So I'm going to be minimizing our background music so we can maximize the music in which we'll be chanting to. But before that, let me reveal what the mantra is. Today we are doing a very famous mantra. Asatoma satgamaya tamasoma jyotirgamaya murtyorma amritam gamaya. And we'll be reciting that last line a few times. Amritam gamaya. Amritam Gamaya. And it roughly translates to I am beyond the darkness. I am beyond the light. Lead me from the unreal, from fear into eternal life. You may find various translations of this, but this is the translation that the singer has used and which we will also be singing after the Sanskrit. And so with that, I... Welcome you all to chant this together. And if not, you are just welcome to listen or move on with whatever else you want to do with your day. I 
Thank you, everyone, for chanting or listening with us a lovely rendition of Asadoma by Sam Garrett and Molly Mendoza. And with that, we will be ending our live stream today. But I thank you all for joining us together. And I'll gladly revisit this one in the future. Happy that you enjoyed it. And thank you, Isabella, for your finger heart. And little Seraph, thank you for your rose. Radhe, Radhe. And thank you, Isabella, for your trio of fires as well. And Rahina, <laughs> thank you for your eleven roses. And Claire. Thank you for your quintet of the bracelets. And so Nam, you share that you just messaged Sam to let him know how many people appreciate his music. How wonderful is that? That's lovely. And Rahina, you ask, do I ever listen to Baba Hanuman by Krishna Das? I probably should because I love Krishna Das, Guru Bhai of Ram Das both devotees of Neem Karoli Baba. Whereas Ram Das was gifted in oration, Krishna Das was gifted in vocation. <laughs> now lovely are them both. And thank you, Starfire, for your pair of roses. And Claire, thank you for your quartet as well. As always, I will be uploading the recording of this live stream to my Yam Socks Live's YouTube channel in case you want to get anything more of it or see other live streams that are posted there. Recently, Sky Guardian has been doing some good work increasing the kind of content that's there on the Yam Socks Live YouTube channel voluntarily. So I thank him very much for that including clipping the readings and chantings, which are in their own dedicated playlist. And now it also serves as an archive for the many interviews that I've uh, very gratefully been a part of, in case you want to see. I guess they are technically also live. <laughs> so you're welcome to check those out there too. Yes, thank you, Sky Guardian. Sky Guardian's mother is going through some difficult diagnoses with her health, so all my best wishes and prayers your way. Now, other than that YouTube channel, there is also another YouTube channel, which is my Yam Socks ASMR YouTube channel. And there we've been doing a different style of content, that is one that is mostly focused on relaxation, but with a spiritual twist. We've been whispering through the Bhagavad Gita, very lovely ancient song. And I've done some videos on anxiety relief, as well as chanting tutorials there, which are welcome to check out. Both of such YouTube channels are linked in the link tree in my bio. 
also on my microphone is a pair of yam socks. I've actually covered my microphone with one of the socks, but the other one I just drape over for for product placement. <laughs> that and this toque that you can buy that has a tiny tiny on it that says yippee because like when Joanna, for example, gifts six roses, a finger heart, thank you for those, but also a tiny diny. The first thing that always comes to mind is a little diny that says, yippee! So it has become a bit of a, a mascot here, <laughs> which I am very grateful for. And thank you, Joanna, for that very well-timed gift. Both of these articles of apparel are found on the link tree as well, the store section. And although it is not encouraged, nor is it expected or necessary, it is just an offer that I give in case you ever want something in return for supporting me. If you're just one of those people that already happen to want to do that, then that's there for you. I can say that I enjoy these these articles of apparel. <laughs> Although money is not a necessity for me right now, I am saving up for a trip to India. And so there I'll definitely be needing some money, uh, not from you necessarily, but to purchase the plane ticket. While I'm there, I will happily, uh, I will happily go wherever the Divine Mother takes me. But... I am not confident in my ability to manifest a plane ticket, so that I'll have to work for. <laughs> and thank you, Claire, for your tiny diny as well. Yahoo! And Rahina, thank you for your one plus three plus twenty-nine tiny dinies. My goodness, now we have a whole assembly of, of tiny dinies here, and I can imagine all of them saying yippee <laughs> thank you an army of tiny dinies for my trip well I'll keep them in my heart as I go but until then I bid you farewell for now and I will likely see you tomorrow around the same time 5pm pacific time may this be an offering this whole live stream to Sri Radha Krishna, the Divine Feminine and Masculine, as the potency and potential of the whole universe. Radhe Krishna, Radhe Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Radhe Radhe, Radhe Shyam, Radhe Shyam. Shyam Shyam Radhe Radhe And thank you, Heaven Bound, for your 35 roses. <laughs> and thank you all for giving me this opportunity to connect with you, and be a witness to the unfolding of the potential already inherent in your very being. May you all have a beautiful rest of your present moment.